Monsieur le Juge Jean Tomka. Judge Tomka, President of the Curatorium, Mr. Secretary General of the Academy, and dear students, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. I would like to start by saying that it is a great pleasure for me to be present here today at the Academy of International Law at The Hague. It is an institution that is synonymous of excellency. And therefore, I would like to thank wholeheartedly the Academy for this invitation, and more particularly you, uh, Secretary General Jean-Marc Touvenin. And if the institutional memory of the United Nations is correct, this is the first time that the Legal Council of the United Nations comes to give a lecture here in The Hague. I hope this is the beginning of a long collaboration between our two institutions. When I was asked to think about the topic I wanted to present, I immediately thought about a field which is very important for the United Nations, i.e. the construction of an international accountability system against people who have committed serious violations against international law. So this is a, a long story and goes back to the very creation of the United Nations. The catalyzing role of the United Nations and the contemporary system of the criminal justice system took place at the beginning of the 1990s. And today I would like to come back to that evolution while highlighting the two functions of the United Nations in the development of international law and international justice. And I would like to talk about the creation of an international mechanism to fight impunity. I would also like to talk about the function of assistance and cooperation, including the cooperation with mechanisms created by the United Nations themselves, as well as the cooperation and assistance to reinforce other mechanisms aiming at trying people who have seriously breached international law. First of all, let's start with the creation role of such mechanisms. The United Nations were involved in the setting up of several mechanisms of individual criminal liability for serious violations of international law. Allow me to first remind you of the traditional, the typical role of the Organization in International Justice. Then, I would like to talk about the establishment of rather more novel mechanism, and it is still difficult to measure up the scope of these mechanisms. And for now, when we talk about the traditional role, I would like to refer very briefly to the different yet very important role that the United Nations uh, had in the setting up of the ICC and other ad hoc tribunals, such as tri Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, as well as other tribunals with an international dimension. Let me start with the International Criminal Court, ICC. As you all know, it is after World War II and after the trials of Tokyo and Nuremberg that the mechanism which would lead to the adoption in July 1998 of the Statute of Rome on the creation of an international criminal court was set in motion. In 1948, the General Assembly asked the International Law Commission to assess whether it would be advisable to create a criminal judicial organ. Furthermore, the Convention of 9th of December 1948 on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide provided in Article 6 that persons charged with genocide or any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3 shall be tried by a competent tribunal of the state in the territory of which the act was committed 
or by such international penal tribunal as may have jurisdiction with respect to those contracting parties which shall have accepted its jurisdiction. So as early as 1948, the question of the setting up of an independent criminal court was mentioned. Later, in 1951, a committee responsible for the overseeing of the creation of an international criminal court was created. However, in 1954, the General Assembly decided to suspend the work of this committee while waiting for the International Law Commission to draft a code related to crimes against peace and security of humanity and to define the crime of aggression. After that, for about 40 years, the project was put to sleep, the project of establishing a permanent international criminal court. It is essentially the very dramatic events of the 1990s that reactivated and accelerated the development of an international criminal justice mechanism. Indeed, with the setting up of two ad hoc tribunals, the one for former Yugoslavia and the one for Rwanda, ICTY and ICTR respectively, I shall mention them later, that's when the international criminal justice took a new step. More than 40 years after the Nuremberg and Tokyo Tribunal, ICTY and ICTR reaffirmed that individuals can be legally liable before an international court and that their statute could not exonerate them from their individual liability in case of serious violations of international law. Furthermore, while ICTY and ICTR were being set up, it appeared very clearly that it would not be possible to develop ad hoc tribunals for all the situations of serious international law violations. So the idea of creating a permanent criminal court started to gain momentum. This is why in 1990, the General Assembly asked the IOC to work on the creation of a permanent ICC or another legal mechanism which would have an international dimension and would deal with this type of international law violations. In July 1994, I always hesitate because I tend to uh, say the figures in Belgian French. In French, it's 94. The Commission approved a draft statute and recommended that the General Assembly hold an international conference in order to agree on the creation of a permanent international criminal court through a convention. And then in 1995, the General Assembly decided to set up a committee tasked with drafting an international convention for adoption. So very quickly, the idea to ask the United Nations to vote on a resolution on the creation of a permanent criminal court was abandoned. And the reason being that such a resolution, by its very nature, would not have any binding force against states which would undermine, right from the start, such an international court. And this is how, in December 1996, the General Assembly decided on a meeting of a plenipotentiary international conference in order to adopt a convention on the creation of a permanent international court. And the Conference of Rome was held, 120 states voted for, 7 against, and 21 abstained. And on the 17th of July 1998, the Statute of Rome of the International Criminal Court was adopted. According to one of its articles, it had to come into force, enter into force, 60 days after the submission of the 60th Instrument of Ratification, Acceptation, Approval or Adhesion to the Sec Secretary General of the United Nations.
many experts were expecting that this new institution would only start working sometime in 2010. And yet, very rapidly, the 60 ratification instruments were submitted, so the Statute of Rome entered into force on the 1st of July 2002. The role of the United Nations oscillated between a catalyzing role, namely through resolutions adopted by the generally, uh, General Assembly, and a rather more substantial role through the drafting of various reports that served as a basis for the pre preparatory work of the Rome Conference and also a role of facilitator, namely through the organization of the Rome Conference to adopt the Rome, uh, the, the Convention. Allow me to remind you of the process which led to the United Nations uh, creation of ad hoc tribunals. So my office played an essential role in the setting up and drafting of their statute. The ICTY for former Yugoslavia and ICTR for Rwanda were legal institutions which were created by the United Nations and they were part of a category called subsidiary organs of the United Nations. ICTY was set up to judge people who had committed serious violations of humanitarian law on the territory of, of former Yugoslavia between the 1st of January 91 and a date which was to be determined after the peace was restored by the Security Council. ICTR, too, was established to try people who had committed acts of genocide or other serious violations of interna international humanitarian law committed in Rwanda and neighboring territories between the 1st of January 94 and the 31st of December 94. Both were set up through resolutions of the Security Council under Chapter 7 of the Charter, and therefore they were binding. In the weeks that followed the adoption of these resolutions, the Office of Legal Matters of the United Nations drafted the statutes for these tribunals and presented the drafts to the member states of the Security Council. My office at the time was also involved in the negotiations between the member states of the Security Council. Thus, the statutes of ICTY was adopted by Resolution 827 on the 25th of May 93, and then the adoption of the statute of ICTR through Resolution 955 on the 8th of November 94. The legal office was later involved in the establishment of these tribunals so that they could start carrying out their respective mandates. Now, throughout their mandates, these two ad hoc tribunals have transformed once and for all the landscape of international law, international criminal law. On the one hand, these tribunals enabled victims and witnesses to express the horrors that they had experienced, and they showed the international community as a whole that the main culprits for these atrocities could be called to answer for their actions. ICTY has charged 161 individuals, amongst which many high political leaders, military leaders, heads of state, ministers, head of police, head, head of the army, etc. As for ICTR, it has charged 93 people. And amongst these persons, we also have high military uh, people, political, media, and religious leaders. ICTR was furthermore the first international tribunal to give a judgment 
regarding genocide. And the first one to interpret the definition of genocide, which was in the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide of 1948. It was also the first tribunal, international tribunal, which defined rape under international law and recognized it as a means to perpetrate genocide. These international tribunals, criminal tribunals, once their limited mandate had ended, left a structure uh, which was a residual function, and we call it the residual mechanism, and that have their headquarters in The Hague and Arusha. It was created by Resolution 1966 of the Security Council of December 2010 in order to carry out the functions of ICTR and ICTY at the end of their respective mandates, which is the case uh, since ICTR closed its doors in 2015 and ICTY at the end of 2017. And once again, the legal office of the United Nations uh, was involved in the creation of this uh, residual mechanism. And these are its functions. It searches and tries the last few fugitives that were still at large. Eight people are still at large today for ICTR three which should be judged by the mechanism, and the other five members or people were sent back to Rwanda to be judged by national jurisdictions. But the mechanism is also competent to carry out some uh, appeal procedures, which is the case in the Karadzic and Mladic cases. It has overall functions, such as the protection of victims and witnesses, the control of uh, sentences, and it assists in the management and archives of ICTR and ICTY. On another chapter, I would like to talk about hybrid tribunals and tribunals which have become internationalized. The United Nations has been involved in several ways to setting up the special court for Sierra Leone and its residual mechanism at the end of its mandate, as well as the extraordinary chambers within the Cambodian tribunals and the special tribunal for Lebanon. As regards the special court for Sierra Leone, if we are to compare it with the two ad hoc tribunals which I have just mentioned, ICTY and ICTR, it has a completely different uh, character regarding the way it was set up. In fact, it was not created through a Security Council resolution, but at the request of Sierra Leone, through an agreement concluded between the United Nations and Sierra Leone. The negotiations which led to this agreement occurred based on a request by the Security Council through a resolution 1315 of the 14th of August 2000. In fact, the, Secretary General, uh, the, Sec uh, the Security Council had asked the Secretary General to start negotiations with the authorities of Sierra Leone in order to establish a special court entrusted with judging the main perpetrators of crimes against humanity, crimes of war, and certain crimes under a Sierra Leone law, which had been committed between the 13th of November 96, which is the agreement of uh, Abidjan, and the rebels. The agreement was signed on the 16th of January 2002 and indicated that the special tribunal would be part of the Sierra Leone judicial system while receiving strong support from the international community. The special court for Sierra Leone, after having judged and convicted the former president of Liberia, Charles Taylor, uh, 
and sentenced him to 50 years imprisonment, closed his doors in 2013, and a residual mechanism was entrusting, uh, entrusted with tracking fugitives, protecting victims and witnesses, and uh, archiving the files. This residual mechanism was set up based on an agreement between the United Nations and Sierra Leone adopted in August 2010. The United Nations were also initiated uh, the establishment of the extraordinary chambers within the Cambodian tribunals. On the 21st of June 1997, Cambodia had requested the assistance of the United Nations and international community in order to bring to justice the main perpetrators of genocides and crimes against humanity which had been perpetrated during the Khmer Rouge administration. And on the 10th of August 2001, the Cambodian authorities, preferring a national structure but with international assistance, adopted a law leading to the setting up of the extraordinary chambers within the Cambodian tribunals for the judgment of these crimes. On the 13th of May 2003, a draft agreement between the UN and Cambodia was approved under a resolution of the General Assembly and the Parliament in Cambodia ratified this agreement later on. The international chambers have jurisdiction for a whole series of serious violations of international law and Cambodian criminal law committed during the Khmer Rouge regime, i.e. between the 17th of April 1975 and the 6th of January 1979. I personally had the opportunity on the 16th of November last to attend the reading of the judgment at first instance in the case against Nguyen Chia and Q Sampan. It was the first time that the extraordinary chambers found against those responsible for genocide of the administration of the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia. Lastly, I would like to refer to a last hybrid special tribunal that was also set up in the framework of the United Nations, but with a very different and specific mandate. That is uh, the special tribunal for Lebanon, which was set up following the assassination on the 14th of February 2005 by Mr. Rafik Hariri, the former Prime Minister of Lebanon, who died in a big explosion which uh, killed 22 people and injured 226 people in the city centre of Beirut. Following this attack, the Security Council of the United Nations allowed the creation of a special tribunal for Lebanon on the 30th of May 2007 in Resolution 1757 adopted under Chapter 7 of the Charter. The resolution also had to set out the provisions of the agreement concluded between Lebanon and the United Nations and it would enter into force on the 10th of June 2007. And may I also tell you that this rather unorthodox way of making an agreement signed between the United Nations and Lebanon more binding was a solution which was found in order to overcome the difficulties experienced by Lebanon at domestic level to ratify the agreement signed with the United Nations. Indeed, indeed, this agreement required ratification by the Parliament in Lebanon in order to come into force, but it was never ratified. Now, as regards the mandate of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, which is quite different from the other international criminal tribunals, it has jurisdiction over the attack over Mr. Rafi Gariri and it is also, it has jurisdiction for all the attacks that occurred in Lebanon between the 1st of October 2004 and 
12th of December 2005 or other subsequent date decided by the United Nations and Lebanon, but that would be related with the 14th of February 2005 attack. Now, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Extraordinary Chambers for Cambodia and the Special Tribunal for Lebanon belong to a first generation of hybrid courts, which, while acknowledging the lack of capacity of the domestic courts of these states to fight impunity, nonetheless recognize the primary responsibility of domestic courts. Alongside these three traditional hybrid courts, recently the United Nations have also been asked to assist in the setting up of a new generation of hybrid courts. And again, relying on the same principle of the primary role of domestic courts in uh, fighting impunity regarding international law violations. And we can mention the setting up of the extraordinary African chambers within the Senegalese courts uh, that were tasked with judging the atrocities committed in Chad under the regime of Isen Abre between June 1982 and December 1990. And may I recall you that uh, about 40,000 people lost their lives and 200,000 people were injured. On the 27th of April 2017, these chambers upheld the decision against his Abre of the 30th of May 2016, whereby he had been found guilty for acts of tortures of torture, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. The trial which took place was unique in several respects. First of all, it was unprecedented inasmuch as a former African president was tried for the first time in Africa, and that is worth mentioning. And he was tried for serious violations of international law. Indeed, it was also the first time that a hybrid criminal court was set up thanks to the cooperation between the African Union and a state of the region, Senegal, through an agreement uh, concluded in 2013. And for the first time, the courts of a state, on the basis of the principle of universal jurisdiction, were able to try and convict a former leader of another state for serious violations of international law. Another recent example worth mentioning is that of the specialized or special chambers for Kosovo, whose mandate is to prosecute certain crimes against humanity, war crimes and crimes under Kosovo law which occurred between the 1st of January 1998 and the 31st of December 2000. These specialized chambers were set up in 2015 and were based on an amendment of the Kosovo Constitution as well as a law passed by its parliament. Other hybrid courts are also being set up, such as regarding crimes committed in South Sudan, and at the request of the uh, Security Council, the United Nations have given assistance to the African Union and the South Sudanese government for the establishment of this hybrid court. And my office has taken part in certain discussions with the African Union and the government of South Sudan regarding the legal instruments which will uh, be necessary for setting up this hybrid court. Furthermore, since the end of 2016, we have observed growing interest in the setting up not of tribunals, but of mechanisms entrusted with the task of gathering, grouping, preserving, analyzing, and, if need be, sharing evidence with domestic courts or international courts. The first such initiative was taken by 
the General Assembly, which in December 2016 adopted a resolution on the basis of which it wishes to set up an international and independent and impartial mechanism tasked with facilitating inquiries regarding the most serious violations of international law committed in Syria since March 2011 and to contribute to judging those who are responsible. This mechanism intends to gather, group, preserve, and analyze evidence attesting violations of international law and international humanitarian law. This mechanism will have to constitute files in order to facilitate and carrying out fair, independent proceedings in conformity with the norms of international law before national tribunals, reg regional or international tribunals who have jurisdiction over these crimes. Following the adoption of this text, the United Nations Secretariat and more particularly my own office and the office of the High Commissioner of Human, for Human Rights, drafted terms of reference for this new mechanism. It is seated in Geneva and has started its activity uh, more than a year ago. According to its report, it has already accumulated a colossal amount of documents, including testimonies, images, videos, attesting of all the atrocities that have been committed by all parties in Syria. A few months later, in September 2017, the Security Council of the United Nations asked the Secretary General to set up a team of investigators tasked with gathering, keeping and storing evidence in Iraq of acts likely to constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide perpetrated by ISIS in Iraq. The Secretary General and my office on its behalf drafted the terms of reference of this team of investigators regarding a resolution adopted under chapter, chapter 6 of the UN Charter at the request of the Iraqi government and in cooperation with the latter. The terms of reference also needed to be acceptable by the Iraqi government, which led to very interesting yet very difficult uh, discussions with this government regarding the sharing of evidence with the Iraqi authorities. The mechanism for Syria and Iraq For this mechanism, the beneficiaries of the evidence gathered should be domestic courts. More recently, on the 27th of September 2018, it was the turn of the, Security, uh, the United Nations Council of Human Rights to adopt a decision in which it was asked for an independent and international mechanism for Myanmar to be set up. It will be entrusted with the consolidating, gathering and preserving and analyzing evidence of the most serious violations of human rights committed in Myanmar since 2011 and to prepare files which could then be transferred to both domestic and international courts. The General Assembly confirmed the creation of such mechanism on the 22nd of December 2018. The Secretariat and my office are now finalizing the terms of reference of this mechanism and we should also be able to appoint somebody in charge of this mechanism in the following, in the next few weeks. To date, I believe that I can say that a new practice in the area of international criminal courts, uh, justice, has emerged. When national courts do not wish or cannot prosecute those who have committed serious violations of international law, the states rarely consider setting up a new international criminal court or hybrid courts. 
but they prefer, in fact, the gathering of evidence to ensure that this evidence isn't destroyed and can be stored and preserved so that in the near future or indeed distant future, criminal procedures might be started before the domestic courts or, if need be, international criminal courts. The Hague Academy, and I'll switch to English. as the United Nations, has two working languages, English and French, and I will continue my presentation in English. I wanted to do it in both languages because I am extremely attached to multilingualism, and I think we need to preserve the multilingual character of international organizations. So, for, mostly for the students, if they have been attentive. Until now, I've been focusing so far on the first function that the United Nations has developed to build an international accountability system which relates to the establishment of international and hybrid accountability mechanisms. Now I want to go to the second function, which is, I mentioned this at the beginning, it's a more diffused nature. It's the role of the United Nations to assist and or to cooperate with both international and domestic accountability mechanisms. So, the United Nations cooperation with international accountability mechanisms has essentially three dimensions. The first one being operational, the second one is more of a judicial nature, and the third one aiming at building domestic capacity to fight impunity. So this capacity building function would be the third one. The accountability mechanisms established so far by the United Nations, they usually need the support of the organization during their operations. And such support is mainly linked to the Secretary General's role in the management of these mechanisms. For instance, the Secretary General is often solicited to appoint judges under the principles or at least to invite nominations from states when an election process takes place. And such a rule can be found with different modalities in the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, the Residual Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, and the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, as well as in the new accountability mechanisms mandated to collect evidence of crimes committed in Syria, Iraq, and Myanmar. Now, in some cases, the Secretary General has the responsibility of initiating the process to renew a mechanism's mandate. As for the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, where the Secretary General has taken the initiative of consulting with the government of Lebanon and the Security Council on the extension of the mandate of the tri tribunal to allow it to complete its work. The Secretary General's management role in relation to these mechanisms may also involve interpreting their constitutional instruments while fully respecting the principle of judicial independence. Finally, the assistance of the Secretariat has become instrumental uh, regarding the funding of some of these mechanisms. International criminal justice is as you should know, a very expensive investment. And for instance, the 24 years of operations of the ICTY cost the international community 2.4 billion US dollars. 2.4 milliards de dollars en français. The 20 years of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda cost 1.9 billion US dollars. Now, while these two tribunals have closed their doors, as well as the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the funding of their residual mechanisms still remains an issue. Even the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, which benefits from the United Nations regular budget, has recently experienced some financial difficulties as member states have been asking for a reduced budget. If we turn to the tribunals which are funded through voluntary contributions, the picture is devastating. Uh, 
as an example this year, the residual special court for Sierra Leone, which has a very modest budget of less than 3 million US dollars, only received three voluntary contributions in a total of 116 US dollars. The extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, which still have ongoing cases, have been struggling for years to get sufficient funding to complete their work. The amount of the voluntary contributions from member states and of successive subventions granted by the General Assembly to face the shortages have been constantly diminishing. And my office has consistently and myself advocated for more secure fun funding, realizing that accountability is a long-term commitment that needs to survive the attention span of the international community. This means basically that voluntary funding, it's a bad model for international accountability. Now, the United Nations also supports international criminal accountability mechanisms through cooperation and judicial assistance. The United Nations, we have been receiving requests for cooperation from the International Criminal Court, other international and hybrid criminal tribunals, and I expect to receive such requests also from the new, newly established investigative mechanisms. And this cooperation uh, which is being requested is usually to obtain the United Nations documents or to contact potential witnesses and victims and interview them when possible. And this is due to the international nature and the global nature of the United Nations operations. We are a little bit everywhere. And therefore, uh, it's very likely that we have, or we may have materials which are interesting or important to uh, criminal accountability purposes. Um, I would note especially, I would like to note especially the cooperation uh, between the United Nations and the International Criminal Court. Because as a matter of fact, the Rome Statute itself gives to the United Nations a central role to play in support of the court and its work. In this regard, the General Assembly of the United Nations and the Assembly of States Parties of the Rome Statute approve a relationship agreement between the ICC and the United Nations of the 13th September 2004, which entered into force on the 4th October 2004. And this agreement creates a general framework of cooperation uh, between all units and entities of the United Nations, including its offices, funds, and programs, and on the ICC, including their secretariat and the Assembly of States parties. Now, since the adoption of this relationship agreement, the United Nations has cooperated very closely with the court on a daily basis. And the Office of Legal Affairs is the focal point for its implementation. It plays a central role in promoting, facilitating, and ensuring that very cooperation. Now, the cooperation includes, as I said, sharing information and evidence providing transportation and security support to the court's field's operations, facilitating interviews with UN personnel, and facilitating their testimony before the court. Indeed, a United Nations staff member was the first person to testify before the court in its first trial, that one of Thomas Lubanga. As you also know, the ICC does not intend and should not intend to substitute domestic criminal uh, justice systems. On the contrary, pursuant to the principle of complementarity, as reflected in Article 17 of the Rome Statute, the court shall only consider the admissibility of a case where the case is not being investigated or prosecuted by a state which has jurisdiction over it, or if the state is unwilling or unable generally to carry out the investigation or prosecution. Cooperation from states and international organizations is therefore essential, in particular for the arrest and surrender of a person for the forfeiture of proceeds, property, and assets, and for servicing sentences. Now, the principle of complementarity that I have just mentioned allows me to transition to the third category of cooperation that the United Nations has been providing to contribute to the building of a criminal responsibility and accountability systems. Thank <laughs> you. 
International criminal accountability mechanisms have obviously constituted a milestone in the development and consolidation of what we like to call an age of accountability. The next step is, however, of a very different nature and implies placing domestic mechanisms to fight impunity at the center of the accountability system. And I still believe that the main responsibility in the fight against impunity remains with states. In recent years, there has been indeed an increasing attention to the role that national institutions could play in the field of transitional justice. We have witnessed, for instance, a proliferation of new forms of domestic tribunals with different levels of international assistance or participation in order to hold accountable those responsible for serious crimes and international law. And the United Nations has been supporting those nationally owned tri tribunals and efforts. Now, the important work of building domestic capacity in these regards continues to be necessary and the assistance of the international community in supporting nationally owned efforts towards ensuring accountability for serious crimes is essential. The Special Criminal Court in the Central African Republic is a good example of a domestic court, although with certain hybrid features like foreign judges, a foreign prosecutor, and a foreign deputy register, steadily moving forward with its own investigations, cooperation with the ICC, judicial training, and outreach to constituencies. The United Nations peacekeeping mission deployed in Central African Republic, MINUSCA, together with the United Nations Development Program and other United Nations departments and entities have assisted the Central African government in the establishment of the Special Criminal Court. And the United Nations also facilitated the identification of candidates with a relevant background for the international component of the courts. Another good example is the special jurisdiction for peace in Colombia. And the special jurisdiction for peace is composed only by Colombian judges, although it allows for the participation of foreign amicus curiae lawyers. Now, the selection of all the judges and other officials of the Colombian special jurisdiction was undertaken by a selection committee consisted largely of international members, and the United Nations had a key role in that committee. Other than that, the United Nations has also been providing capacity building to domestic judiciaries, in particular through training and support to internal reform processes. Such efforts intend, among others, to align domestic systems with international rules and standards. Now, ladies and gentlemen and dear colleagues, Establishment and cooperation, or foundation and cooperation. These are the two key aspects of the United Nations role that I, I wanted to share with you today in what regards the United Nations role in the development of an international accountability system. And this would bring me to a conclusion which is more of a personal nature. As legal counsel of the United Nations since 2013, um, I have participated in the establishment of new criminal accountability systems, like the ones for the collection of evidence of crimes in Syria, Iraq, and Myanmar. I also had the opportunity to close three accountability me mechanisms. The Special Court for Sierra Leone in 2013, the ICTR in 2015, and the ICTY in 2017. I have coordinated the judicial cooperation that the United Nations provide to international and domestic criminal accountability mechanisms. And now, after five years, I can tell you this work, it's both fascinating and discouraging. It's fascinating because it's a real contribution to the fight against impunity and to the recognition of the victims of the most serious crimes and the international law. 
is discouraging as accountability processes for these very serious and complex crimes are long, they're often very long, and they follow dynamics which are far away from the contemporary need for immediacy. I have noted how these two feelings transcend and have an impact on the support provided to the international accountability system. In the life of an international accountability mechanism, the first days are always promising. But as time goes on, complex judicial process continued, alleged perpetrators, victims, and witnesses get older and even pass away before the judicial process have concluded, and states' fatigue increases, resulting in decreased funding, among others. Now, this fatigue can also be perceived in the media, which do not cover some situations anymore, or even in civil society, whose attention and emotions are seized, unfortunately, by new atrocities. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, it is essential that we continue to study and discuss about appropriate ways to fight impunity. After 25 years of international accountability me mechanisms, it is important to reflect and discuss both the legacy of these mechanisms and on ways to adjust to new needs in a framework of limited resources in order to continue to build effectively an international accountability system. So in this regard, I'm once again very grateful to the Hague Academy of International Law because I do think you are the perfect academic forum for this intellectual brainstorming. Thank you.